Uh, yeah, let's continue. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Liu Yang from Peking University. Uh, Liu Yang did his undergraduate studies at Tsinghua University, uh, followed by his uh, PhD at Princeton University uh, with Professor Mansur Shainga. Before joining Peking University as a faculty, he was also the postdoc uh, with a prestigious uh, GLAM fellowship at Stanford University. Uh, Liu Yang's expertise is in studying strongly correlated physics in ultra high quality two dimensional systems. Uh, he particularly focuses on the fractional quantum Hoare effect and the Wigner crystals, with a number of very interesting experiments in wide well quantum Hoare systems, as well as the observation of Wigner crystals for systems in a strong uh, magnetic field. Uh, today, he's going to share with us some of his. Uh, recent research on the new methods in the experimental studies of the quantum Hoare systems. Uh, so without further ado, let us welcome Liu Yang, and Liu Yang, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Yang Bo, for introduction. And uh, I didn't realize like uh, I have been not giving a talk for such a long time. <laughs> so, so today I'm going to talk about the two New method instead of the one that uh, I previously proposed to Yambo because uh, I think it's good to start with something physically interesting and also we know the physics and then I will introduce uh, our new method of capacitance measurement where we still have a lot of new things to be explained and uh, these two works are actually uh, carried out by the two students the Huang Ke and Zhao Li Li and uh, the first one was a collaboration with Lin Shi in his group at Peking University. So let's start from the first uh, topic, the 2D holes and the large hydraulic uh, hydrostatic pressure. 2D holes are exactly very interesting and as I introduced to many people and we have very good quality. So actually this hydrostatic pressure experiment, we follow the previous experiments let, um, done by Letley's group and also Gabor's group and Purdue, where they mainly focus on electron systems. And very recently, we got some interesting whole samples and we put the sample into the hydrostatic cell and apply a pressure. The good thing for holes is actually the density of this holes doesn't change as we apply the pressure. This is very different from electron samples where when they apply the hydrostatic pressure up to like 10 kilobar, the density almost vanishes to zero. In our samples, the density stays as a constant, almost you can see the black, uh, black dots. And uh, therefore, all these experiment results or evolutions we see from the sample must due to the pressure effect, not the density. This is, I think is a, great advantage of our experiment. So, and we do see some evolutions around the new equals to three half. As we know, three half, they have fractional quantum pulse state and four thirds, five thirds, seven fifths, eight fifths, and so on. And in the experiment and zero pressure, which we mark as 0.3 kilobar. And then, Standard means like we don't know the pressure, it's almost zero, but definitely not zero. So we see a strong four third state and a strong five third states and weak seven fifths and eight fifths. So this chase looks quite normal. And we'll apply a pressure and about a 1.8 kilobar pressure, four third states become pretty weak. And uh, if we continue to apply pressure up to around like 13 or 12.6 kilobar, three, uh, the five third states become very weak. And this evolution we want to repeat, uh, repeat in another sample. We took another sample next to the previous one. So they were expected to be the same. Apparently as usual, which is normal in whole samples, they look slightly different, but general qualitatively, they are similar. So at zero pressure, we see strong four third states, five third states, signaling this is the normal sequence. And uh, when we apply about like 6.6 .6 kilobar, we see five thirds become weak, eight fifths and four thirds become strong. And we do see disappearance of the seven fifth state, but uh, reappearance of 
appearance of the 10th, 7th. So basically, all the fractional quantum Hall effect with even nominator appears. And all the fractional quantum Hall state and odd nominator become either weak or disappear. And then we tilt the sample by 37 degree. A very small tilting, if you, if you think about it, 37 degree doesn't change much. And uh, we see everything suddenly back to normal. We have about 10 kilobar and the 70, uh, 37 degree tilting, which means we apply a parallel field. Then four thirds, five thirds states become strong and seven fifths, eight fifths become weak. Everything back to almost like the zero kilobar data. So we want to understand what happens. Actually, if we just look back into the literature, we realize that uh, in silicons or aluminum arsenic, where they have two valleys, the chase or the data sequence looks almost the same as our data when their two valleys are degenerate. So same, to be precise, silicon, they have the plus X and the minus X valley. When they are degenerate, we see there's only odd nominator fractional quantum Hall state, and there's no even nominator, uh, sorry, my mistake. We see only the even nominator fractional quantum Hall state, but no odd nominator. And uh, in aluminum arsenic, where we can tune the degeneracy of the X and the Y values. So when the X and the Y values are degenerate, we do see strong four third, and this one is the eight fifth, and five third state become weak. So basically, this is like the silicon and aluminum arsenic data. We realized that on high pressure, we do have two lambda levels become degenerate. And we can measure the gaps and try to do some quantitative analysis. So here, the black and the right ones are the energy gap, excitation gap of the five third state and four third state. And we see like it, just as the data shows, four third states become weak around like two kilobar and then become strong again. Five third state continuous become weaker and weaker until, but everything appears saturating at about the six kilobar, namely like six kilobar, four third gap doesn't change, five third gap doesn't change. Looks like the two levels are almost degenerate and never split again. And we can estimate how large this effect looks like. We know there are two ways. One way is like the five third state become weak because of the two levels are approaching each other. And uh, we can take the slope and try to estimate one value, which is about 10 micro EV per kilobar pressure, which is pretty small if you consider it. And uh, we also know another fact from other experiments like aluminum arsenic or like the spin transitions that four third state will have a weakening when the lowest two lambda levels are separated by about 2% of the electron Coulomb interaction, which is measured as E square over epsilon LB. And this is an experimental evidence from aluminum arsenic valley splitting or from gallium arsenic uh, spin transition. And uh, we get a number of about the 30 micron EV per kilobar. And uh, this is uh, still a very small number. And we, we want to know if it happens on high field in the fractional quantum Hall regime, pressure can do something to the lambda levels. What happens on the low field? And low field is very hard to analyze the data because the holes, they have non-parabolic dispersions, they have those rush by effects, uh, all those kind of nasty stuff. But there's one qualitatively observation here. And about like 0.1 Tesla, about 0.1 Tesla, there's Shubnikov de Hans oscillations, which we know from the textbook. And lower than the Shubnikov de Hans oscillations, we see a very slowly varying oscillations. These oscillations are actually due to the spin flipping perceptions. And uh, the frequency of this oscillation is 
proportional to the spin splitting or the Fermi contour differences between the two spin species. And we, we see that they are periodic in the, as a function of one over B. And when we apply pressure, we do see this splitting become smaller. And around six uh, kilobar pressure, the decreasing saturates. And it doesn't vanish because maybe many effects, we don't know. But in general, from the low field data and high field data, they are consistent with each other that the pressure can decrease the spin splitting. And uh, it's probably because of the strange spin orbit coupling in, uh, of the holes. But we realized in the 97 data, which showed by Lightly, which is the experiment one, we know for electrons, high pressure can cause the g-factor, effective g-factor goes to zero. And uh, maybe it's the same physics phenomena that leads to this degeneracy of the two spin species of holes, because holes and electrons, they're not that far separating from each other. They are in, not independent. And uh, so I hope someone can give us some interesting input of this type of measurement. And also like if other experiment systems can show similar effect, that would be very great. And uh, now we come to the second part of this talk. I just to give a quick break, uh, because the previous one is simple. And this one is not quite simple because it's a new method plus new physics. And capacitance measurement has been carried out like many years, I mean, decades ago. So it has this part of the physical picture means we have two plates. We apply a voltage and trying to change the density of the quantum wire by delta Q via the voltage, right? And uh, when the density of the quantum uh, of the 2D gas reduces, it also causes the Fermi energy to reduce. So that's the, uh, the voltage across this barrier has two parts. One is the delta Q over CG. CG is the geometric effect, which is the electric field caused the differences. And the other one is the change of the Fermi action, uh, Fermi energy because of the density of state changing. No, no, sorry, not density of state because the density changes. So the Fermi energy of the 2D gas changes. Then therefore we can consider the samples has two capacitance in series with each other. One is the geometric one. The other one is the quantum capacitance one. Quantum capacitance is proportional, directly proportional to the density of state of the 2D gas at the Fermi energy. So it's a very good measurement of the Fermi surface property. And uh, in 93, actually, this is a pretty old experiment. We do see in a very wide quantum well when multi subband occupies, the capacitance between the gate and the 2D shows kinks. I mean, you can't resolve from here, but if you take the derivative, you do see there is a peak or a jump in the capacitance, which is the occupation of the different subband in the quantum well. And later, I mean, time goes, so the technology becomes better and better. Uh, it, people can measure capacitance oscillations in twisted angle graphene. And uh, also there is another way actually, very interesting way where people measure the penetration field. So instead of directly measuring from the gate to 2D, they are actually measuring a leaking field, which is, because the 2D doesn't follow the density change as expected. So, so these are two major ways of measure capacitance. The capacitance measurement is a very powerful way because it directly probes the density of state property and the Fermi energy, which there's no other experiment can do this, except I think, I think except the STM measurement. And also the capacitance is able to see the invisible state. Invisible means the transport doesn't show it, such as weakness crystals or 
double faces or those type of localized state. And uh, there are significant difficulties in the capacitance measurement. The first one is the capacitance of the typical sample is very small. As you can see from the twist angle graphemes, the capacitance is about 20 femtofarad. And the 20 femtofarad is not the killing number. But if you consider we're measuring the capacity inside the cryostat, the cryostat, I just give a comparison. If we have the two, four millimeter wire, uh, separated wire, and each of them is one centimeter long, AWG26 wire, which is typically we use in the fridge, the capacitance between these two wires can be as large as 120 femtofarad orders of magnitude larger than the capacitance we want to measure. And uh, nonetheless, we are measuring 1% change of this 20 femtofarad capacitance, making extremely hard for such an experiment. And also, in order to probe the quantum properties of the system, we have to limit our excitation energy, means we can't change the density we can't change the delta Q basically by a lot, which means we can only use the measurement excitation voltage of the order of 0.1 millivolt. So we try our Leon, best. Uh, before, before we move on, can I ask a question about the previous yes. slide? Uh, can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit more about this uh, leaking field uh, experiment? So if my understanding is correct, so you have a, a layer in between the two capacitance plate. And if that layer is a perfect conductor, then there is no leaking field, right? Yes, yes. So if it's an insulator, then uh, the field will leak through uh, the middle layer. So, uh, uh, so the leaking field is a way to measure how incompressible, how insulating the, the layer in between is. Is that uh, uh, the uh, of this measurement? Sort of, yes. But uh, there uh -huh. is uh, one thing. So. So the in-between layer, when it's insulating, there's no leaking car, uh, current. But mm -hmm. when the Fermi energy jumps, so for example, it, it, even if it's not insulating, but the Fermi energy has a discontinuity, it can mm -hmm. also leak. So basically, it's measuring when this plate has a Fermi energy jump, there must be some charge coming out of it. Sure, I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you measure some leaking signal. Okay. Like this Shubnikov the house oscillation, you see over here, the plate is not insulating, but it's still. So that's also the quantum part of the capacitance you're talking about. Sort of, yes. So what is the advantage of this uh, comparing to the usual capacitance measurement? So the leaking current measurement and the capacitance measurement, what's the? Uh, so leaking current, uh, leaking field measurement yeah. is sort of a poor man's solution. This is quotation by Mansur. <laughs> poor man's solution. Yes. Okay. So Why? basically, huh? if you think about like uh, if we can't measure the capacitance directly, what we can do is we can grow a sample and put another 2D layer as close as possible to the measured 2D. So basically mm -hmm. we are measuring the whatever the, so we're probing one, the property of a 2D layer by a la neighboring 2D layer. And they, are, they can be very close to each other. Okay. So that uh, when the Fermi energy of uh, the device under, under testing changes slightly, the other one can see it. Yeah, so uh, why is it uh, better or is it easier than the measurement of the capacitance? Ultimately, yes. it's really, ah, I see, okay. It's easier. So the, you don't need to like it. So you, basically you don't need to see, uh, to use a lot of fancy electronics to do the measurement. I see, I see. Okay, okay, sure, thanks. And also another another easier reason is the signal can be large. You can see like uh, the 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 leaking or the charge transferred to between in between these two layers can be up to like nano ampere. So it's like a failed capacitor, but uh, you can still see the signal. 
Yes, yes. Right. Okay, okay. thanks. And uh, so our solution is we want to have as small power as possible. So we use a real passive bridge and the sample stage. And with about like a 0.1 millivolt uh, of excitation voltage, we only dump 10 nanowatt power into the fridge. This is considerably small and is negligible. And uh, in order to measure very small capacitance, we use very high frequency, which is 100 megahertz frequency. So we know like the capacitance, when we measure it, we apply a voltage, it generates a current. Capacitance is omega C, one over omega C. So when frequency increases, the current actually increases too. Then, which naturally says the higher frequency can easier increase the signal output of the capacitance. And we want to keep this frequency not that high, not up to gigahertz, because we want the H4 omega, which is the frequency, omega is the frequency of the measurement signal, is considerably small than energy scale of the 2D system. So 100 megahertz gives about one micron EV, which is still very small compared to the excitation gap of the fractional quantum hall. But if we go to gigahertz regime, some other stuff comes in. And uh, with the passive bridge, because it is a bridge, so we can measure the absolute value of the capacitance if we calibrate the system, which is easy to do because uh, the system doesn't change. You always use the same wire, same electronics and so on. So it's okay. And also the bridge can separate the resistor and the, uh, sorry, the capacitive response and to the conductive response of, this, of the device. Because we can separate the in-phase and the out-of-phase part of the signal. And to this, the simple me uh, measurement method is like we change the balance of the bridge by changing the resistor arm so that uh, the output value goes through a minima. And this minima corresponds to the balancing point of the bridge, which gives uh, out the simple equation, which the resistance ratio is the equals the capacitance ratio. And the, the minimal value, the output signal doesn't vanish to zero as normal, which because the phase of the two signals doesn't match. Then we can separate the signal into two parts. The one part is the, the one, the green one, which changes as the balance of the bridge changes. And the blue, the blue one doesn't change as the balance point of the bridge change. And uh, so that the green one, which we call as VY, is the capacitance response of the device. And the blue one is the resistive or conductive response of the device. We can separate these two, gives us a huge advantage in this measurement that uh, if we measure a device like here, we have a capacitance from the gate to the 2D, but the 2D itself has a conductance. There is a resistance. It's not zero resistance. There is a voltage built, current flowing, and so on, so on. So we can separate them. The black one is the Vx output, which is proportional to the G of the 2D gas. The red one is the capacitance response which we can easily quote and to the capacitance of the 2D. And we see that in C2 transport measurement is almost the same as the VX, which has the very nice developed plateau and integer fillings like new equals to one, two, three, and so on. While the capacitance doesn't have a flat plateau. And I want to emphasize that because we only dump 10 nanowatt of the power our fridge remains at 10 millik. So the measurement can be performed as low temperature as possible. I mean, it's comparable to the transport measurement you see from other experiments. And uh, 
so we're first going to analyze our result. For, uh, we see a reducing of the capacitance and, uh, and the function of increasing magnetic field significantly reducing. And this is actually, I want to say, consistent with the penetration field measurement, where as we have discussed, I have discussed with Yang Bo, means the red curve is the leaking current. When the leaking current is zero, means the capacitance between the, of the 2D is good. And uh, when the leaking current goes upward, namely the capacitance of the quantum of the 2D reduces significantly, which is consistent with the reducing of capacitance in our measurement. And we measure non-Kelvin to remove all those Shubnikov, the Hans oscillations of quantum power effect and so on. We do see a power law dependence C is proportional to B minus 2.95 to me is almost as good as minus three. So to the accuracy that we have, and we have a three order of magnitude decreasing of the capacitance, which is quite astonishing, unexpected before I started this uh, such experiment. And uh, also, the system has the Shubnikov the Hans oscillations. If we plot the C times B cube, which we cancel this decreasing by multiply the B, B cube, we do see some SDH like oscillations where we can get a tau Q of about two picosecond. And you can see there the fitting has a, almost like a three order of magnitude, which means it, it's very likely to be a real one but not important. Important one is from the experiment, it seems in high magnetic field, the capacitance is on the edge of the gate where we have two samples, two gate pairs. One is 100 by 100 micrometer, the other one times two, so it's 200 by 200. The capacitance and high field is a factor of two is not four. So we think that's a gate edge effect. So it means all the charging and discharging appears only on the side or on the edge of the gate. And uh, we can estimate some length scale, probably it's of the order like 0.1 micrometer size. If we just use, think about so the charging appears over here. And uh, also we try to change the gate voltage and high magnetic field, nothing changes, which means the capacitance and high field doesn't rely on the 2D gas underneath the gate, which also suggests it's an edge. It's not the gate, gated re region, sorry. So, well, that's all experiment effect where's the interest in physics. And if it focus on integer fillings, we, we see some interesting. You remember I discussed that we can separate the capacitive response and the resistive response. Like uh, the resistive one, the VX one has a plateau, capacitance one doesn't have a, pla doesn't have a plateau. And uh, this is actually consistent with the uh, early data 2003 from Lloyd Engels group, where they measure the microwave dissipation from the waveguide. And their measurement frequency about 200 mega, uh, megahertz, very similar to ours. They measure the conductance has a zero plateau and the integer fillings, which is interesting, good. And we have similar quality data, similar quality samples. And we see, okay, if this is simple around non-plateau like capacitance, when we change the temperature, it should stay non-plateau. However, when we increase the temperature to about 300 milli K, 300 milli K is not that high, but not quite low. We see integer fillings start to show a flat bottom in their capacitance result. As flat as you can claim here. So, which means this non 
plateau-like features inside n equals to one is actually some physics happening only below a few one or two hundred milli k. Well, what's that? So happily, people have done similar microwave measurement before before us, so we can reference their quote. We can quote their result or their claim. And check with ours. So basically, what they see is around n equals to one and two, these integer fillings, they see resonance peaks and of the order like a few gigahertz. And these resonance peaks are consistent with developing Wigner crystals inside the integer quantum Hall effects, yeah? which is sound and pronounced as, as solid as those Wigner crystals and very low filling factors. And this, Wigner, this resonant peak disappear around like 100, 200 milli K, saying the Wigner crystal melts and such temperatures. And uh, this is very consistent with our observations that around 150 or 300 milli K, quantum hall become flat. And uh, below that temperature, we see features inside all these integer fillings. And we can plot the capacitance as a function of n star. n star is the actual density from the integer, which is defined with the such equation, easy equation. Means we have a completely field lambda level, which is integer quantum Hall effect. And those extra electron or holes has a density of n star. And we see a linear dependence of the capacitance as a function of the n star square, as linear as we can imagine, as linear as we can understand. Okay, it happens linear to be to be linear around equals to two, three, four, and uh, within the range where we expect the Wigner crystal to appear, which means at low temperature, thirty millik temperature the non-zero, non-plateau-like behavior of the capacitance is a response of the weakened crystal. And we want to apply it to n equals to one and something weird happens. N equals to two, we have a linear or quasi-linear dependence and n equals to one, you know, this is like new, right? This is a V ship, we can call that capital V. And this one looks like the great new like, which has a shoulder and small new star, has some extra kink and smaller new star. And actually, happily, Lloyd has another paper in 2010 where they do observe a skirmion like behavior when in a very similar density sample, their sample density is 2.7 and our sample density is 2.5, uh, sorry, 2.2, very similar to each other. And around like 2.0 density, they see a Wigner crystal, uh, no, uh, the skirmion crystal like behavior where we see this extra shoulder or kink or curved response. And we think this is consistent. Possibly this increasing or over reaction of the 2D system for the capacitance is a reaction for the skirmion like feature. And uh, this brings me to the end of the talk because I really don't have a very good picture because these data are fresh out of the oven. We only have summarized this data like one or two weeks ago. And we would like to present and share with everybody so that uh, maybe someone can be interesting and uh, try to give us any suggestions. That would be appreciated. And uh, before the ending, I would like to thank the two students, Huang Ke and Zhao Lili, who carried out the hydrostatic pressure measurement and the capacitance measurement. And also the samples from Princeton. And I also would like to thank the Lloyd Engel for his very helpful discussion and very nice 
previous work. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Liu Yang. Uh, uh, any questions from the audience? Questions? Uh, okay, maybe I'll start with one. Uh, so I think it's very interesting to see with uh, crystal-like behaviors near the integer feeling factor. So what you are saying here is that uh, you think uh, the Wittner crystal only forms at very low temperature near the uh, middle of the plateau, right? So yes. At higher temperature, it will just uh, melt. So uh, at very low temperature, how do you know it's a, a crystal structure? Can it be just like quadri holes and quadri particles being pinned down by the disorder and uh, it just localized uh, states of these quadri holes and quadri particles instead of... So what are some of the evidence of a, a, a lattice structure that you can see from your measurement? Okay, so one evidence was done by Lloyd where they see mm -hmm. this like a gigahertz like resonance in the sigma. And the only crystal phase can show resonance and the random localized state doesn't show a pronounced resonance. This resonance is like a gap, right? It's like a gap for the crystal? It's, it's, it's like a crystal resonance. It's like, like a crystal core. resonance. Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. So when, when there is a crystal, when you shake it, like the sound resonance, like the mm -hmm. quartz crystal resonance, see, okay. they have a resonance peak. And also in our measurement, we see like a, around 300 milli K when it shows the plateau, this is consistent with what he, we expect in a localized state. Mm -hmm. It doesn't transmit these signals, means they only shake around their local positions. They doesn't respond to external ones. I see, I see. So, so the previous we, one, so measurement the frequency is like the phonon of the Wigner crystals they have seen. Uh, yes. Is that, or, is, that is vibration of uh, the Wigner crystals? It's not quite like a lattice vibration, but it's related to the phonon. Okay. So it's kind of like a domains of the Wigner crystal and they shake collectively. Mm, I see, I see. And, uh, and in our case, like if, if we don't have a crystal phase, then the two gates are actually separated from each other. Mm -hmm. There should be no capacitance signal that we can measure because right. our geometry is not directly from the gate to the 2D, but it's mm -hmm. from the gate through the 2D to another gate. Mm -hmm. I see. So if, uh, if it's a local, all localized, uh, nothing to transmit the, the signal or the charge, then the conductance goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So we don't measure any signal. Yeah, maybe you can explain this to the audience as well. I know you have explained to me before. So if it's a Wigner crystal, why do you have finite the capacitance? So if it's a Wigner crystal, then the lattice of the Wigner crystal can shake. Can deform, it, let's say. Can deform, yes, sorry. Okay. So when, when we apply a magnetic field, the Wigner crystal lattice deforms so that effectively it has a it has an epsilon. Mm -hmm. So it accumulates charge at the surface of the Wigner crystal, which is two ends, right? On the edge of the gates. So basically, if you're player applying a gate voltage, you are basically compressing or stretching the crystal to minimize the electrostatic energy. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Then the the deformation of the Wigner crystal effectively can transfer some charge from one side of the crystal to another side of the crystal mm -hmm. and cause the surface charge accumulation. And this is seen and then cancels some of the electric field we applied right. in the gates and uh, behaves like a capacitance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To a classical view, it, it means like if, it, if there is no crystal, if it is just like a piece of wood, then it the epsilon goes to infinite. Uh, if it's just a normal insulator localized charge, uh, there's no long range yes. correlation. Then there's right. no there's no long range of correlation. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have epsilon. When it has a long range uh, correlation, then there is effective epsilon. Like yeah. the like all this capacitance epsilon. 
So, yeah, so uh, I think you mentioned a little bit, but you didn't go into too much detail. So I think when we discuss uh, the, one way to see if it's a, a crystal-like structure is also to see how the capacitance depend on the volume or the area of the gate, right? Can you uh, right. go a little bit more into that? I think that's a very interesting point, actually. Actually, we don't have much results yet uh, and then when we change the volumes and so on because we only have two pairs, 100 micrometer square and 200 micrometer square. Talk about speculations because uh, uh, this is still looking for theoretical explanations, right? So you can right. speculate a little bit on what we could expect to see. So if we actually reducing the, the distance between the two gates, then probably the, when, when the distance between the two gates is comparable to the domain size of the regular crystal, we, we may see an enhanced signal. Or if we change the frequency, we may see something very similar to the one that uh, enhanced the pro uh, propagation of the wave-like structure. Mm -hmm. or, or like the resonance, there, there must be a resonance of the Wigner crystal that can transmit the signal so fast that we see a non-vanishing when and frequencies that uh, Lloyd sees the resonance of the sigma, which is uh, this peak, we might be able to see a very different behavior or uh, LC-like resonance uh, behavior of the capacitance. Mm. And uh, that could be interesting too. Okay. Oh, that's so namely, uh -huh. namely we, we generate a frequency that can cause the Wigner crystal resonance. And this resonance is, might be size dependent or enhanced by different geometry. You mean the resonance frequency? Yes. Okay. So, okay. so we have this two wires, two gates parallel to each other and separated by a small distance. And that distance is comparable to the Wigner crystal domain. Mm. And okay. uh, which could be interesting too. Okay. But before so, I move so, on, I see, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. So now like here we have then two gates are well separated from each other. So they can be treated as independent. And mm -hmm. I don't think there is uh, one piece of domain that connecting these two. So basically it's like an, it's like a disorder the weakened crystal in between these two gates. Mm -hmm. So there's no direct correlation between the electrons underneath the two gates. Right. Right. Okay. Before I move on, I think we still have time. Uh, I don't want to monopolize here. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, Pinaki. Pinaki, you can just uh, unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Yanglu. My name is Pinaki, and I am completely ignorant of this field. My yeah. very naive question is, uh, don't we expect particle hole symmetry for these uh, electronic systems or? Yes, we do expect. That's a very good question. We do. But you said that uh, at the very beginning of your talk, you said that for um, electrons, the density changes uh, dramatically with pressure, whereas for holes, they do not. Right. Yeah. So, is there any simple way I can understand that? Yes, you do. So this is a very, like a, a long-term project, or you can see, like from '97, or actually there are works even before that, 1970s, 1980s, when people try to understand the doping mechanism inside these three five semiconductors. So make it simple. The electron band has multiple minimums. Okay. And uh, so it has a gamma point minima, which is a gallium arsenic. And also it has the X minima, which is L gas. 
these samples are modulation doped, so means the dopant are inside the L gas, where the 2D electrons are inside the gallium arsenic, right? Then when we apply a pressure, uh, the quantum well structure or the, the gamma point of the gallium arsenic increases and uh, the energy of the L gas minima, which is either in gamma point or X point, depending on the fraction, that one reduces. Or basically the X point value reduces and gamma point increases. And some certain point, when they equal to each other, naturally we don't have electrons inside the quantum well, right? Right. And for holes, there's no such thing. It only has one maxima and the gamma point. There's no competing other maximas. I see. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Great. Uh, any other questions? I actually have a, a follow up uh, from. Pinaki's point, but not just at the, uh, for this holes of the electrons, but at the filling factor, integer filling factor, uh, around the center of the plateau, you also have uh, quasi holes and quasi particles. Yes. So what you're saying is that you can form weakened crystals of quasi holes. You can also form weakened crystals of the quasi particles. They're almost symmetric yeah. about almost. the center. That's yes. also interesting because normally quasi holes and quasi particles can behave quite differently. So, but. Here it seems so, like, mm -hmm. any comments? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, I, I want to point to, in general, they are symmetric. The, the non-symmetric behavior around n equals to two, that's because one is in n equals to zero, the other one is in n equals to one. So they are in different land levels. But around n equals to one, they, I mean, one could say they are symmetric, uh, one could also say they are, it's not quite symmetric. Okay. So the, for, the idea is that you all you, you, on both sides you have weak crystals. That's your speculation. Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, this is confirmed by the Yong Chen's work. They do see weak crystal like structures around equals to one on both sides. I see. Right. And also to follow up your previous uh, answer. So if I have a capacitance measurement, then uh, if the whole bar is a, is a metal, mm -hmm. then uh, the capacitance should be proportional to the area of your gate, right? Yes. But if uh, the whole bar is not a metal, but it's a weak crystal, uh, do I expect the, the capacitance to be proportional to the uh, circumference of the uh, uh, gate or the area of the gate? I may expect uh, if it's a crystal, it's a circumference, not the gate, uh, not not area. Okay, because only because deformation only happens. Uh, uh, right, there's no like boundary. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. I see, I see. That's that's very interesting. Mm. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Oh, by the way, I want to mention what, one more thing. Sure, yeah. So mm -hmm. we have performed experiments in graphene or other stuffs. Mm -hmm. So it looks like uh, the this behavior, this reducing behavior is, so the capacitance reduces faster when the quality increases. So that may be- It's another. not universal. You're saying the exponent is not universal. Uh, which I'm not quite sure. So it may be the exponent is not universal. It may be like, yeah, it's more like a flat and reducing part. Reducing may be universal. It yeah, just- the uh, power law, it's in the power law of this log, semi-log plot is, oh, this is log-log plot. Yeah, this is log-log plot. So the uh, power may be remain the same. It's always a power law. Yes, it's a power law. The power may be remain the same, but uh, the prefactor might be different. Mm -hmm. but the power could be the same. I see. It, okay. The power could be the same, but uh, I need to really double check. Is it, is it also a power law for RxX? Since you're looking at very low field, right? Here you have RxX that is not zero. So 
Is RXX also decreasing as a power law with uh, increasing magnetic field? No, not okay. really. But in Carpino okay. geometry, it does have a power law. And uh, it's in like uh, one over one plus omega C times tau square. Mm -hmm. How does it depend so, on B? Uh, the so that's field? depend on B. So omega C is proportional to B. So it's omega C to the power of something, but it's not negative three. Yeah, yes, it's not negative three, it's negative mm -hmm. two, more like negative two. And uh, from the experiment data, actually we checked it uh, in a Carpino geometry data, it's not an universal power. It's, mm -hmm. it's relatively close to two. So okay. it could vary from 1.7 to 2.3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if this capacitance dependence is universal, that would be very interesting. The suspicion yeah. is that it's almost like RXX. It's not universal, but uh, it's a power law. But if it's universal, that is quite surprising, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Mm. Because there's no, there's no really protection here, right? This is not even in a topological regime. This is just- No, this is non -case. states. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Everything, should, all the correlation should be killed yeah. by temperature. Yeah, if it's a universal, against the different sample sizes, uh, different temperature, mm -hmm. uh, different experimental conditions or density, that would be uh, very surprising. Yes. Mm. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, last call. Mm. If not, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Liu Yang for his interesting talk. Thank you. Then maybe we can set a break room. We can discuss a little bit. Uh, yes. Uh, assign. No, how do I create? I'll just create like this. Ah. Okay, I'll just click this. Hmm? Uh, I never use uh, recreate. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. Oops. Oops. Do you see me? <laughs> no, not yet. Is uh, our pit here? Uh, I think many people are still here. Yeah, I'm trying to see how I can create create a, a room. Mm. Anyway, I think we are left, uh, I think only two or three of us. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to choose this. Do you choose this? I will say, okay, we can stop recording.